بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد Tonight, dear brothers and sisters, we're going to uh, continue with another chapter from the book Usul al-Tafsir of Imam Shah Dahlawi. And this chapter today, it talks about the different schools of tafsir. First of all, we want to talk about the word tafsir itself, what it means. And then later on, we can get into these schools and we can explain what these schools are. Tafsir, it means, when we translate that in the English language, it means to comment something, commentary of something. So I can say a word, it may be ambiguous word, and a person can say this is what he meant, so he is commenting on that word. Explanation is just another word for it. Sometimes if we get a little bit more technical, if we want to be more technical with words and things like that, and then there is another word which is called the exegesis. In the academia, for example, when we uh, study about this field, we will see the word exegesis or hermeneutics. Christians, they do have that too when it comes to the Bible. So there is a tafsir, there is a commentary on the Quran. And even on the hadith, there are commentaries. There are commentaries of texts as well, books that people, scholars, they have been written throughout the years. So that's what tafsir means. Fassar ayu fassir tafsir. Now, the Imam goes on. Shah Dahlawi goes on into mentioning these categories of uh, tafsir, and he says the first one is the tafsir of muhaddithun. Tafsir muhaddithun. As you can tell from the name of it, Muhaddith is somebody who is, who deals with the science of Hadith. It comes from Hadith. Muhaddith is the person who deals with Hadith, scholar of Hadith pretty much. So uh, what does this stand for? Well, there are a numerous books of Hadith written that are based on narrations. All right, based on the narrations of uh, a hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, and Shah Dahlawi here he says he mentions a hadith marfu' which goes uh, back to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it has a connected chain all the way to Prophet. He also mentions the hadith mawquf which goes all the way to the companion but not to the Prophet, and the also maktu' which is uh, which reaches all the way to the successor of the companion. And these, you know, the scholars, when they wrote these books of tafsir, they included all of these hadiths in order to uh, comment certain verses of the Qur'an. Because they just didn't want to comment on their own and say, oh, this is what I think it is. No. They wanted to see if there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ or from the companions or from the tabi'ins and just put it there and say, you know what, this has more authority than my own personal interpretation. Um, often this is called uh, tafsir bil riwaya. When you study some uh, ul- ulum al Quran books, you will find this word uh, tafsir bil riwaya, which is a tafsir based on narration. So you will not find much there analogy or rationality or trying to uh, explain the words, the meaning, and all that stuff. It is mainly based on narration. So then he moves on into the second one. He says that the second category or the second school of tafsir is a school of al-mutakallimun, tafsir al-mutakallimun. Many of you know and many of you may not know the science of kalam. Science of kalam is a science of theology, the Islamic theology, that deals mainly with the issues of creed. So that is the science of ilmul kalam, it's called. So it... It also a part of it is the rationality, utilization of the rationality, and it is very important. So there are many uh, many books of tafsir based on that as well. 
that is interpretation uh, of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on. If I may say a very famous hadith book of the first category that I mentioned, the hadith of the, I mean the tafsir of muhaddithun, I can say it's uh, Ibn, Ibn Kathir, which is very well known, famous. It is uh, tafsir Jalalain that we often go through here in the masjid too, we read the, the meaning and, and all that. Then you have also the tafsir of Imam Al-Tabari, which is the most well known and it's like an encyclopedia <coughs> of uh, tafsir. Uh, these are all based on the narratives. And when it comes to the tafsir of the mutakallimun, uh, tafsir of the, uh, you know, of uh, this other category or this other school, it's also called the tafsir uh, bil ra'i. And a famous scholar of this one is Imam al Razi, who wrote the Mafatih al Ghaib, or so called, or, or known to be the tafsir al Kabir. The big tafsir. This is an amazing, amazing tafsir. Again, mainly on rationality. Birra'i, they are utilizing rationality to interpret verses of the Quran. But again, this doesn't mean, because somebody can say, oh, what happened to the hadith and what happened to that? No. They're still utilizing, but they are, they're utilizing hadith and all of this, but they are also... Uh, putting or inserting in the commentaries in the verses where they can their own rationality and why does this make sense why this is so amazing why this is so unique for example from the rational point of view so there's nothing wrong with that you know uh, they're not going to rationalize aqim salah for example perform the prayer they're not going to get into but things that may be ambiguous or you know verses in the quran that may be ambiguous and so on uh, the third category uh, or the third school of, uh, of tafsir is the tafsir of the experts in juristic principles. This is the tafsir of the fuqaha. Faqih is somebody who is able to teach and interpret the Islamic law. Faqih. So these individuals who were very well versed in Islamic law, they had the ability to also comment the Quran, not paying too much attention into the narrative side of it or rationality or any of that, but giving you a clear picture on the commentary of the verses where they had rules in. Ayatul, muhkama, uh, ayatul Ahkam, for example. Verses where there is a lot of ruling. And they would comment mainly, they would uh, pause mainly in those verses. Then we have another uh, school of uh, tafsir, which is the tafsir of the grammarians and lexicographers. Uh, this is uh, grammarians, how, this, how the verses are built, you know, the, the Arabic grammar, the qawaid, you know, they would go into that because the Quran, the qawaid of the Quran is used as the main qawaid. Again, the... Uh, grammar of the Quran it is used as the main grammar for the Arabic language too so that's the essence of the Arabic language the grammar of the Quran um, so they go into the Quran and they try to see how the words are built how they're put together and and so on um, and then you have the but they would also go into the meaning of the words you know come up with this and that uh, Imam Zamakhshari would be among those who is well known into this, uh, into this uh, school. The tafsir, then you have the tafsir of master literators, which is the people of the expression. You know, it's, it's another thing, grammar, and it is another thing, expression. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expressed, you know, uh, in the ways how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expressed himself in the Quran. Uh, then there is also the tafsir of the skilled reciters, al-mukri'een, qurra, mukri'een, those people who are specialized in the ahruf. Ahruf, these are the different dialects that the Qur'an was recited. Some people, unfortunately, you know, because they don't know these nuances, they would consider this as a different uh, Qur'an because it simply is recited differently. So this is a different version of the Qur'an. No, we don't have different versions. We have different recitations, different dialects of reciting the Qur'an. For example, أَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ Right? The Hafsan Asim, the main one would be أَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ 
but according to another uh, dialect of the Quran would be أَأَنْتُمُوا أَشَدُّ Now this is a dialect. This is not changing the meaning, but this is simply uh, a dialect that the Quran is permissible to be recited according to the statements made by Prophet Muhammad himself allowing such a thing to take place. Or Ridwan, according to Shu'bah, for example, and uh, uh, Asim, Shu'bah and, 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 and Asim would be Rudwan, instead of Ridwan, Rudwan, and so on. There are so many other uh, different dialects. You have seven official ones, then you have ten, uh, and there are even more, but those are unofficial ones. So there are these scholars of these dialects that the Quran can be recited according to, and they would get, you know, into that kind of science and also comment on the words, why they're this way and that way. And also the last thing that he mentions right here is the tafsir of the Sufis. And this is very important as well, because this is the tafsir as it is known often in the books of Ulum al-Quran, tafsir al-Ishari or tafsir bil-Ishara. This is the tafsir, uh, or in the English language it's called the allegorical commentary of the Quran. Right? Allegorical commentary of the Quran, which does not uh, give you the literal meaning of a particular verse, but it gives you the hidden meaning of that verse. For example, Musa alayhi salam was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what when he was in the valley of uh, Tuwa? What was the first command? Ikhla na'alayk, right? Take off your shoes. Innaka bil wadi al muqaddasi Tuwa. Take off your shoes. So now, that's the literal meaning of the verse. But the inner meaning of that, the scholars of the, as, uh, as, the, uh, as uh, Shah Dahlawi says, the, the people of Suluk and the people of ha uh, Haqqaiq, people of the knowledge of traveling the path, and also the people of the realities. These are inner realities, experiences that they, uh, that they, uh, that they go through by, by contemplation and dhikr and so on. Uh, they, they would say, you know, these commentators, they would say that the right, for example, the right shoe of Sayyidina Musa represented this dunya. And the left shoe would represent the hereafter. It is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Musa, Oh Musa, when you come to me, I want you to come without anything in your mind about this world or anything in your mind about the hereafter. Come to me as you are. So again, this does not negate the fact that God told to Musa literally to take his shoes off. But they're given also another Baltini meaning to this verse. Another inner meaning of this verse. Again, people who are qualified to give these meanings. That's why we call this Tafsir al-Ishari, Tafsir bil-Ishara, or the allegorical uh, school of Tafsir. And these are all acceptable and well-known throughout the Muslim world. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين